Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our Storage and Flexibility Net Zero webinar. My name is Scott Milne. I'm Head of Insights at the Energy Systems Catapult, and I've been running our overall Innovating to Net Zero program here. And the work that you'll hear about today on storage and flexibility is one part of that. I wanted to give you a brief overview of the wider program before handing over to my colleague Dan Morant to lead the webinar and Alex Buckman will be chairing the Q&A session. So if you'd like to pose any questions for Dan, uh, you should see a Q&A feature in Teams. And if you drop your question in there, Alex will curate those and lead the, um, lead the Q&A session with Dan at the end. Moment, try and get my camera live for you. Forgive me, camera's not showing, but uh, we'll crack on. Um, so, as I say, this webinar and the series of reports that we're launching today is part of our wider Innovating to Net Zero program. We launched the main report in March, and it takes a national whole energy system modeling approach to ask how can we transform power, heat, transport, industry, land use, the entire economy to get to net zero by 2050. And we look at different scenarios, perhaps involving more of an emphasis on societal change on the one hand, or more emphasis on technology change on the other hand. And we commissioned a series of engineering deep dives to help shine a light on the potential of a, a range of technologies. And you'll hear about some of those in the deep dives today in relation to storage and flexibility. Other supporting analysis in the Net Zero programme has looked at public understanding of Net Zero, uh, digitalisation for Net Zero, and they're both available on the website just now. And the next report and webinar that we'll be launching in the series uh, same time next week will be nuclear for Net Zero. Uh, so go to the ESC website for registration details. Um, it would be great to see you again there. Uh, for today's session then, I'll hand over now to Dan Morrance. Thank you. Sorry, everybody, I'm muted. I just talked to myself for about a minute. Right, try again. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending. Uh, I thank you, Scott, for, for handing over. My name is Dan Morant. Uh, and before I get into the detail, I just wanted to provide a bit of background. So, we've developed our new storage flexibility model, and it lets us compare different storage of flexibility technologies on a level playing field, uh, which provide value to most value to the energy system. No markets, no policies, just the cheapest way to make a reliable net zero energy system. And whilst we did see an important role for batteries, one of the things we're finding is that there's also value from other storage and flexibility technologies. Uh, that could be hot water tanks, could be medium to longer duration of thermal mechanical storage, or it could be something like uh, shifting flexible demand, so shifting demand. Uh, and this is what kind of led us to, to think about what we wanted to do for this work. So we decided there were four areas that we wanted to look into uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and we, these we've termed as technology deep dives. So it's non-battery electric storage, vehicle to grid, thermal energy storage, heat network, and specialized batteries. And I'll go through each in, in turn and then uh, I'll provide a summary of kind of the findings, the overarching findings. So for the non-battery electric storage, um, our approach was first to carry out a, a review, to understand the existing and emerging technologies that are already out there, uh, current and future applications, and then the technical and economic parameters of these technologies. So uh, power costs, energy costs, uh, efficiency, etc. Clearly, policy and regulation is also an, an important uh, part of the picture. So, so we looked at policy and regulatory barriers. And then finally, we carried out a analysis. So when we reviewed the available technologies, we found 13 non-factory storage technologies identified, uh, and eight of them had enough data for us to really assess. 
And obviously that included your, your more mature technology, so your pumped hydro storage, but there are also some technologies that are, although maturing, are, are less mature. So, so liquid air energy storage is a, is a good example. And as the chart shows, and as most of us know, clearly one storage technology isn't going to do everything. So some will do uh, very kind of quick high power stuff for short duration, and then you go all the way up to, to things like pumped hydro storage, uh, which is doing much longer term, higher energy, lower power. Uh, so the data we had we looked at cost projections for uh, six longer duration storage technologies, and then I come on to a minute the, the shorter duration. Uh, we found a range of data sources, uh, and we took the averages. As we approached 2050, that there was less data available. So for the data we had, you could see how the how the cost looked to be be falling or, or rising, but, but falling. And then we applied that to, to the average. Um, so what we found is that there were steady capital costs for pumped hydro, adiabatic compressed air, and gravitational storage. Uh, as those technologies are relatively mature, at least in our understanding of the, of the technology. Uh, and then when it came to flow batteries, so vanadium redox and zinc bromide, uh, as well as liquid air, the costs are expected to drop significantly, but they still appear to be more expensive than pumped hydro storage or uh, compressed air, particularly for, for, for longer duration. So the, the power costs are, are lower because the energy costs are, are still higher when it comes to longer duration. But of course, that's not the full picture. So uh, some of these smaller technologies have, have less no geographical constraints and shorter construction time. So that, that also needs to be taken into account. So then as I said, we also looked at short duration technologies. So here it was flywheels, supercapacitors, and superconducting magnetic energy storage. Uh, we found that all of them are likely to experience significant cost reduction in the next few years. They've not, none of them have been particularly deployed very much. There's still there's a lot of technical development still to be done, so we can see significant cost reduction. But even then, there are still questions around future commercial viability. Uh, in a lot of the modeling analysis we did, there's still questions as to whether whether they're required. Um, now, I talked earlier about our storage and capability model. Uh, we also have our ESMO, which is an energy system modeling environment. That's our kind of standard uh, national national energy system use cost optimizing model. Uh, and, and although we're increasingly using the, the storage model to look at storage effectability, ESME is nice to use just to get kind of a quick uh, overview of, of what we think is happening. So here we did some modeling analysis in ESME and what we did is we created what we termed a long duration generic storage technology. So it, it wasn't compressed air, it wasn't pumped hydro, et cetera, et cetera. It was just a, a generic long duration technology. And we, for, with the exceptions of cost, we took the average uh, values of, for the operating parameters of things like efficiency from the data we, we got. And then what we did with cost, we looked at what happened to this technology if we assumed the kind of higher end of our costs and what happened if we assumed the lower end. So if we first take the, the higher end of the course, what we found was that actually it's not selected. So it doesn't compete with the technologies that we already see. So what you see is the existing pumped hydro storage in a system that that's that seems a cheap option that's already there. So that's pretty utilized. Um, lithium ion battery storage begins to come online. Uh, and then there's some mechanical slash thermal storage. And then if you move to a lower cost, so you're now assuming the more optimistic projections for, the, for these future technologies, then what you see is that suddenly this generic long duration technology uh, is producing, a, providing a significant amount of storage capacity. Uh, it's pushed battery, battery up, battery out, batteries out. Uh, the pump storage is still there, but again, that's because that's mainly existing. And what you see is also the total storage uh, capacity has, has gone up. So it's not just replaced the batteries, now, part of that will be to do with the longer duration, but it also suggests there's a change in the way the rest of the system is operating. 
So if there is cheap, if there is enough relatively cheap storage available, then that allows the system to operate in different ways. So some of my key findings from, from the, the first report was there is clear value in medium to long duration non-battery electrical storage within a net zero energy system. Uh, there's several non-battery storage technologies in development. It's difficult to see a clear front runner. You can make cases for many of them, but it's hard to say this is definitely the, the one that's going to, to progress. And then as we showed in the previous slide, the capital cost of non-battery electrical storage need to reduce for it to become cost competitive uh, within a least cost energy system. And then, so I should have said at the beginning, there are four reports that accompany the, the work I'm talking about here, uh, and they're all online on our, on our website. I think they've been sent, sent to you all. Uh, so here is, is another conclusion that I haven't talked about in this presentation, obviously we're limited for time, but it is in the report. So non-battery electrical storage technologies have several uh, market policy and recommendation, uh, sorry, regulatory barriers. Uh, and we've listed a series of recommendations to help remove these barriers. Uh, and as I said, they're detailed in the, re in the report, but most of them focus around uh, improving existing market design and where necessary, developing new market design. So now I'm going to move on to vehicle to grid. Uh, I'm going to move fairly quickly through all of these because, as I said, there is the, the more detailed reports, and also I want to want to leave time for questions. So here there was a slightly different approach. Uh, we focused much more on, on the modelling. So we have done a, a previous study looking at variable to grid, and this this built on that. So the big question we really wanted to, to begin to try and answer was what's the role of B2G in enabling the decarbonisation of transport and energy systems? So we looked at three scenarios. Uh, a vehicle to grid scenario where uh, electric vehicles can obviously operate in a vehicle to grid mode, but only vehicle to grid mode. So there was no managed charging going, going on as well. Then we had unmanaged charging, uh, which assumed that the consumers just charged as and when they wanted to. And then a managed charging system where it was only charging, there was no uh, not electricity going back to the grid, but it, but it was managed at the time, so it's one of the most beneficial to, to the system. And then we analysed the system to ask how does flexible energy generation, grid connected energy storage, BTG capacity and intermittent energy generation change between the scenarios. Uh, so, so the way we did this, scenario, we used our consumer vehicle energy integration model suite, uh, the CVEI, Uh, so it's compared to several individual modules uh, and it was the V2G module that, that was focused on and it was modified and upgraded to form a standalone V2G module. Uh, more details it, again in the report, but essentially the V2G module calculates V2G capacity based on the number of EVs and the number of charging events and the time and location of these charging events and then the usable battery capacity of the electric vehicles. Uh, and then some of the scenario assumptions, uh, I won't go through, through all of them, uh, but you can see with the charging strategies, as I've already talked about, unmanaged was unrestricted, uh, managed was shifting away from demand away from peak times, and then you had the bi-directional charging within V2G. Uh, unmanaged charging could happen at all locations. Managed charging was assumed to only be uh, at home because it was assumed the time that you would most want to charge was probably overnight. Uh, and in V2G, it was both home and work. Uh, and as I picked up on, on earlier, these weren't mixed scenarios. Each one was only allowing one type of charging strategy. So you can see V2G capability was only available on the V2G scenario. Uh, so as expected, what we found was that the direct competitor to V2G is, as a storage and flexibility service, is grid connected storage. So Although we looked at other things for, for the purpose of, of this presentation, I'm going to focus mainly on what's happening to, to grid connected electrical storage. So first of all, before we go into that, this is the V2G scenario. Uh, and you can see by 2050, it's selecting over 50 gigawatts of V2G, uh, more like 55. And electricity storage is staying 
relatively constant. So that's predominantly the pumped hydro storage. It's not needing to build a lot of battery storage because it's got the, the vehicle to grid providing, providing that service. So then if we compare the V2G scenario to the uh, managed charging, as I've said, the most notable changes are happening around the level of electricity storage capacity. Uh, and if we look to, to 2050, we can see that there's 40 gigawatt hours, or approximately 40 gigawatt hours less grid connected storage under the V2G scenario than the unmanaged. This is because uh, not all of it, but a lot of that is in factory storage and the, the V2G is, is providing it instead. Uh, and then this is likely, from, from a whole system point of view, this is likely to, prov likely to provide value. Uh, it's grid connected and electrical storage it's likely to be more expensive than, than, than V2G. So there's a, a significant kind of benefit there from using V2G. If we then move on to comparing the V2G to the uh, managed charging, then we find that the managed charging itself provides a significant level of flexibility. So there's less benefit uh, from the V2G. Having said that, there is 10 gigawatt, approximately 10 gigawatt hours less grid connected storage. Um, so this shows a, a relatively small benefit, but there may be further value that V2G can provide over shorter time scales that aren't represented in this, in this modeling work. So there's, there's two elements to that. The first is uh, system services. So, so in the storage and flexibility model, uh, services can be provided by, by EVs, but again, managed charging could be there as well. Uh, and then the one that's more likely to be uh, or potentially having an impact is that on the on the CVEI modeling, which is based, a lot of it is based from ESME, the time, the minimum time periods are around three to four hours. So anything that's happening on a, a more granular scale than that is not picked up by the model. So it may be that there's more benefit from V2G if you were looking at say an hour by hour basis and here it's clear that further work requires. Uh, to summarize that some of the key findings, V2G could provide significant value to a net zero energy system, providing over 50 gigawatt hours of flexible capacity by 2050. V2G is most favorable when compared to unmanaged charging of EVs, so it reduces the need for grid connected electrical storage capacity. And as I said, when you get to managed charging, because managed charging is providing a fair amount of flexibility itself, the value of V2G is lessened, although there still appears to be some value by reducing the need for, for grid connected storage. So moving on to thermal energy storage for, for heat networks, uh, the approach taken here was more like uh, the, the non-battery electrical storage. So first of all, we did a, a kind of a review. So we looked at the existing and innovative technologies out there. Uh, and then we looked at current and future applications. And then because it was needed later on, obviously the thermal properties. So the, the uh, heat density. And then again, policy and regulatory barriers were, were considered. And then we did some analysis on the feasibility of thermal energy storage for, for heat networks. So we looked at different uh, size storage capacity to meet a given demand and how that cost of that, how much of the demand it allows to be met, uh, whether you need a backup system check it or more detail. So as I said, the first thing that we did was a technology review. Uh, and there's three broad categories of thermal energy storage. So there's sensible thermal energy storage, and here there's no phase change of chemical reaction. You're simply storing energy by, by raising the temperature of the storage medium. Uh, then there was latent heat or uh, latent heat storage using phase change materials. Uh, and here the energy is absorbed and then released during the, the phase change of, of, the material, of the material. And then there's thermochemical uh, thermal storage uh, and here the, the energy is uh, stored and then released by reversible exothermic and endothermic chemical reactions. 
And they're obviously three quite broad categories. So within the report, we then identify specific technologies and innovators within each of those categories. Uh, and as I said, we, we reviewed the thermal and operational properties of the technology. Broadly speaking, and this is broadly because it depends on the material, but broadly speaking, sensible thermal energy storage has the lowest energy density, uh, and then it's followed by phase shade materials and then thermo chemicals. So policy barriers, energy storage, uh, we've broken these down into uh, three broad categories, so economic, social uh, and technical policy barriers. And now within the economic, we found uh, the costs were a barrier, there's also business as usual inertia. Within the social, it, there were skills gaps, so we just don't have the uh, level of expertise that we require. And then consumer acceptance is potentially a, another kind of big uh, barrier. So potentially you're, you're storing or you're installing uh, behind the meter systems. People have to be comfortable with having them in the house and then they have to be comfortable with, with using them. And then there's a range of technical challenges uh, and including space constraints. So there's several ways that these can be overcome. Uh, increasing the level of RD and D support and I think there that the final D is, is should be highlighted. So uh, demonstration is, is equally, if not more important than just the R and D. And sometimes it, it is missed out. Uh, improve the prospect of integration of, of heat and power systems. So there's potentially benefit to be, to be had there if you can switch between between vectors. Uh, and then this kind of second point follows on from that. So incentivize the, the use of time of use tariffs and dynamic electricity pricing, and then Going back to kind of the, the issue of consumer acceptance, we need to the way you get consumers to accept something is that is at least at first to raise their awareness and, and educate them. So, so that's that's very important. Uh, so as I said, we did some modeling analysis. So we developed a, a modeling tool which identifies the thermal energy storage capacity needed to meet a typical demand profile. Uh, for a very thermal output power from a number of different heat sources. Uh, so in this case, we used demand data from the Isle of Giga, uh, more because it was available than, than anything else. Uh, I believe we assumed a, a biomass boiler for, for this particular graph, although again, we can, we can change the, the heat generation source. Uh, and then the main output that are produced is a plot like the one I've shown, shown here, and that shows heat demand, uh, heat output and the energy stored over the course of a day again or, or a week or a year the, the model can decide uh, and then also the required uh, backup capacity so what we found with this analysis is that you have to begin to drastically kind of oversize the thermal energy system if there isn't a backup uh, boiler or something similar in place uh, and then from this output there's some other kind of calculations that, that are carried out for the storage volume for both uh, water based and phase change material uh, storage systems were calculated, uh, as well as the annualised cost, and that included the main water heat source, the backup boiler, and the thermal energy storage. Uh, the other thing to say is that at this point we didn't model thermochemical storage. Our review showed that it was the most or the least mature technology, and therefore it was. It wasn't included in this analysis, but the model has the capability to to do it. OK, so here's the kind of. Typical results that, that we got, so from all energy storage systems to meet larger amounts of heat demand by increasing the capacity and this reduces the need for a backup system. And obviously there, there there's a question around, around costs. We found so we compared a water based system to a phase change material system, and we found that the water based system was always uh, lower costs. And that this difference increased as you increase the storage capacity. Um, however, we also found that the storage volume for the water based system is around twice that of the, of the PCM. So, although on our analysis, water based systems were cheaper, if you have a, a system in a, an area with very high land values or where space is particularly constrained, then there may well be a, a very good case for for phase change material 
storage. So moving on to the, the key findings, thermal storage provides value because it reduces the size of heat generation required, uh, but, but there's a balancing act here between how big you have to make the, the thermal energy storage. In most cases, we found that uh, sensible heat, and really that's hot water tanks, was more cost effective than phase change materials. Uh, and then this, uh, but as I said, uh, in particular cases, there may be there may be a, a benefit from having phase change materials because of the reduced volume required. And then something that we found that is in some ways perhaps the most uh, important thing, thing to, in my view to come out of the thermal energy storage analysis is that even with larger volumes of thermal energy storage, there was still a need for some sort of backup peaking gas. Uh, and in theory, the cost-effective nature of heat network means this peaking tank could come from energy any uh, vector. But in our analysis, it's certainly kind of typically at the moment it tends to be a, a gas boiler, which is clearly unlikely unlikely to be compatible with a net zero energy system, so there needs to be fought around what the backup system um, is going to be. And finally, second life batteries, uh, and again, this, is, this, uh, this image is probably getting quite, quite familiar now. So carried out a, a literature review, uh, here we didn't really look at different technologies because it's we're looking at the second life batteries of lithium or second life of lithium ion batteries. So they come out of the EVs and then potentially they're they're refurbished and reused. So we looked at what the, the applications are, are likely to be for those second life batteries. And then we also took quite a bit of time to look at recycling and consumption processes. Because recycling is really the other option. So understanding the pros and cons of that is important. To understand the benefits of second life batteries. Then we considered the policy and regulatory barriers. And then finally, we carried out a modeling case study. So here we looked at how does performance and cost of second life batteries compare to, to other technologies. So when we looked at the suitable applications for second life batteries, uh, potentially supporting vehicle charging and remote locations providing reserve capacity to, to maintain power reliability, peak shaving, arbitrage and renewable farming, and then smoothing out daily variations in renewable outputs. So here's an example output. So the model uh, developed an operational profile of second life battery energy storage system alongside demand, renewable generation and grid import. Uh, there's more more detail in the report, but essentially the model determines the operation of the case study system each half hour settlement period. Uh, period uh, and the figures show the operational profile of second life batteries alongside demand, renewable generation, and grid import. Uh, and it indicates that when renewable generation is higher than demand, so the blue line is, is above the orange line, uh, if storage is not full, and that's the, the purple line, I appreciate this might not be that, that clear. Uh, then, then the storage is charging. Uh, conversely, if the storage is full, then the renewable surplus is, is curtailed. Uh, so we assumed, we effectively assumed a microgrid system here for, for this model. Now, of course, we could scale that up to, to the whole country, uh, but the data we had was for a kind of typical area of, of South Wales, something like Bridge End. It wasn't specific to Bridge End, but, but that kind of type of size and profile. Uh, so. Uh, cutting on the so when the storage is full, the renewable surplus is curtailed because it's a microgrid, uh, and then the opposite holds true when the generation is not sufficient to meet demand. So the blue line is below where the orange line. The battery discharges and further energy is imported. Uh, the other thing that, that I should say here is obviously I'm saying second life batteries here. We then looked at a range of other uh, energy storage technologies to compare. So we looked at conventional lithium ion batteries pumped hydro storage, liquid air, and pressed energy storage. So from that, you can then calculate the levelized cost of uh, various storage technologies. Uh, and you can see that the levelized cost of storage of lithium ion batteries over uh, a period of, I think this was 20 years, but it's in, in the report, uh, 
was higher compared to that of the second life batteries. And this is because although you needed to replace the second life batteries more often, they are substantially cheaper than lithium ion. So, and I guess this was always going to be the big question. We knew that per, per kilowatt, second life batteries were going to be cheaper. The question was, would the reduction in performance and therefore the need to replace them more, would that, would that trade off work uh, against the fact that they were cheaper? And, and our analysis suggests that it does. Um, again, compressed air and pumped hydrogen storage were both found to be cheaper than, than the second life batteries, but they're not really competing. They're, they're uh, carrying out different roles. And again, it was a, it was a long lifetime that really uh, benefited them when you were looking at levelized cost of, of storage. And then uh, when it comes to second life uh, batteries, I think it's important to talk about supply chain barriers. So the, the first image on, on my left, that shows a number of EVs. And then from that, we could calculate how many we assumed were, were retiring. Uh, and then we also looked at what we thought the, available, uh, the, the peak demand would be, and then available power for second life batteries, given when they're retiring. Now, Clearly, you wouldn't expect to try and meet all the peak demand with second life batteries anyway. But as an example, you can see that from the, the UK market, there won't be enough uh, retired EVs, so enough available second life batteries uh, until 2040 to meet, to meet national peak demand. Uh, so that means, again, again working backwards, that up until 2030, 2035, there's still likely to be uh, supply chain barriers. So although uh, second life batteries potentially look like a good bet, at least to start with, we're going to be limited to the, to the number that we can, can deploy. So to summarise, second life batteries are likely to be cheaper than new batteries. Uh, other factors such as the electric vehicle supply chain also be considered. So there's unlikely to be enough second life batteries, uh, as I said, until, well, until 2040 to meet peak demand. So then you're working your way back from that kind of 2030s, if perhaps when it starts to look interesting. Uh, and then again, this is something that we discussed more in the report, but the second life battery market would appear to benefit from uh, the current lithium ion battery recycling infrastructure being ill suited, both in terms of maturity and cost effectiveness, to deal with the large volumes of retired batteries that we're going to start to see. Okay, so that's a, a very kind of brief summary of, of the four, uh, four deep dives that we carried out. But there were also some common themes and barriers that, that we found. Uh, so there was no technology that was found to be a complete kind of write off. Each technology definitely had potential to provide benefit to a future net zero energy system and could be deployed in, in significant scale. Uh, in each case, this benefit was because, or at least partly because it, they became more economically viable than their competitors. Or in the case of thermal energy storage, it, it made district heat networks more uh, economically competitive. But I should also say that there were substantial amounts of uncertainty. So each technology had the potential to provide benefit. But I, I think with each one, there was there was questions around either would we see the cost reductions that were perhaps kind of forecast, or with second life batteries, when would we see the kind of rollout of, of, of enough retired EVs? So there's still a lot of work to try and uh, resolve some of the uncertainty. Uh, and then there's a number of common barriers which were identified. So uh, technical barriers which could be reduced by innovation and then policy barriers which uh, could be overcome by, by a series of uh, recommendations that are made in the reports. Uh, and as I said earlier, they're often around better market design. Uh, so I've gone through that fairly quickly. So we've got quite a bit of time for uh, questions. Obviously, there's a lot of bits where I haven't gone into detail, so we'll try and get through as many questions as possible, a lot more details in the report. But if we don't get through the questions, we're, we're happy to kind of come back to you offline and discuss further. Uh, so I think I'm uh, gonna handing over to Alex now. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Um, sorry if there's some audio issues there. Um, uh, I think uh, it, it sorts itself by it sorts itself out by the end. Um, we've had plenty of questions coming through, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for those for those questions. Um, I'll go through them in chronological order 
them uh, as to when they're they're asked, and also I'll try and group a few um, together as, as well. Um, so Dan, if you're happy to answer these uh, for me, um, James McDoughton um, uh, from uh, Pumped Heat, uh, he's asked some questions about the costs that we use. So first of all, there's the two questions related here. One is, um, do we within our modelling, do we distinguish between um, pounds per kilowatt hour and pounds per kilowatt? Um, uh, and and there's a follow up question there in terms of uh, what were the costs that we use for lithium ion batteries? Sure. So thanks for the question. Uh, in terms of the first question, yes, we do distinguish between our power costs and, and energy costs, both included. Uh, the lithium ion battery costs, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what they are, but I can certainly provide them. Uh, they, they're based on uh, a system called the available uh, reports and data, uh, and obviously they, they decrease as we hit 2050, but I can I can provide that uh, offline. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, and the uh, next question from, um, some, from an, an, an anonymous question asker. Um, how did the rest of the system change uh, when more long duration storage was deployed? Yes, so we didn't look in detail uh, exactly to how the change was happening in this study, but we have certainly looked at how there is a change as you increase the level of storage that, that's generally available um, under other analysis. And it's all the kind of stuff you would expect. So if you've got more storage in the system, you see greater utilization of uh, generation uh, and a lower utilization of kind of thermal peaking plants. Uh, on the scale that we were talking in, in, in this report, you probably wouldn't see a significant drop in the installation of peaking plants, but you would see a drop in the kind of utilization, uh, which makes it easier to hit your carbon targets. And then potentially that has knock on, of, and again, this wasn't assessed in this report, but you probably see knock on benefits uh, in things like industry, so things that are harder to decarbonize. If you make it easier to decarbonize uh, power and, and transport and heat, then you've got less kind of emissions there. That gives you more leeway to do something with, with the harder stuff, so it's industry and agriculture. So that's where you'd, you'd expect to see the system change. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, there's some really interesting questions from, um, from David Kemp. Um, and also created by uh, Bean Beanland, um, and they're around the representation of behind the meter storage. So, um, I mean, if I go through these one by one, um, David Kemp initially asked, do we represent behind the meter aggregated battery storage um, alongside grid connected storage? And um, and then within the from the heat side, do we do we also represent? Oh, or the question was why why are we not uh, representing the aggregate aggregated behind the meters heat storage, um, and uh, and and Bean Beanland also looks at uh, uh, as, as asked the question about whether domestic scales uh, storage technologies um, warrant a modelling exercise of their own, um, and has the energy systems catapult done any modeling around this so all around behind the meter flexibility really okay i'm going to take those questions uh in reverse because my memory is awful and also the, the sound dropped out slightly on the uh first part so i might come back to that but i think the final question was is there uh or, or should there be some analysis carried out on our kind of specific sort of domestic behind the meter storage uh and i think the answer is is yes so our storage and flexibility model does recognize behind the meter storage both uh thermal and uh, electrical, uh, but because it's looking at the whole system, it's still, it's more granular than anything we've done before, but it's not, it's not a simulation or anything like that. So I think some analysis looking specifically at uh, behind the meter storage, which perhaps then fed into something like the storage and flexibility model would be, would be really interesting. Uh, we ourselves, our team, we haven't, we haven't done anything like that, but uh, we do have, other teams within the catapult that have looked at uh, behind the meter storage in more detail tends to be on a, a sort of simulation rather than optimization. It tends to be more short term, but that's certainly something I think we'd be interested in looking into and happy, happy to discuss more. So I think that was the final 
question. Did I answer yeah, I mean, part of the second question? Was the second question about uh, sorry, the second one? The, the second question was um, on the um, heat network thermal storage um, uh, kind of project that we've done here. Uh, we were mostly looking at uh, distribution connected uh, thermal energy storage, and so the question was. I suppose if I could rephrase it in a different way, um, what what would be the um, impact of representing behind the meter thermal storage as opposed to distribution connected thermal storage within that model? And does it uh, warrant um, further exploration? Uh, yes, so I think further exploration is always, always something that's good to do. Uh, the reason why it wasn't done was really, um, it begins to make it a more complicated question and we, really wanted to get something that we had done well rather than kind of overstretch. Uh, again, we do have modeling to the storage effectability model uh, does look at kind of distribution connected storage. Uh, and it may well be that there is a benefit from that. I think with district heat networks, there is there's definitely a case for large distributed storage, but uh, that's not to say it's definitely the right answer. Uh, and certainly, on our on our modeling that we've done, we do see behind the meter domestic scale storage uh, is really important. Um, obviously, thermal storage in general allows you to decouple. If you electrify the heat sector, which tends to happen with the thermal energy storage, you can decouple it from the decouple electricity demand from the massive kind of morning uh, peak heat demand in the winter. So it definitely is important. And again, we'd be happy to look at it in more detail uh, in different relation to kind of uh, heat networks. And then Alex, you can have to repeat the first part of the question. I, because I, there were three points, weren't there? I think uh, the first point I missed, uh, the, the sound dropped out. Yeah, I mean, it is on behind the meter battery storage and how we how, um, do we do we represent behind the meter battery storage as well as grid connected storage? Uh, yes, so we, we represent both. Uh, what we tend to fi find is that the first first pick is normally the distribution uh, battery storage. Then if more storage is needed in the system, if you kind of push the model to require more storage, then fairly quickly it looks at um, behind the meter storage. So we do see it and like all of this, this kind of modeling, stating the obvious, your outputs are clearly dependent on your on your inputs. Uh, and I think when it comes to behind the meter batteries, things are moving so quickly that always assuming that you've got the most up to date costs is is difficult to do. So yes, we, we'd certainly again be, be happy to look at that in more detail. Absolutely. And if I could just <clears throat> uh, reiterate there within our current uh, modeling using the storage flexibility model, which is uh, a whole systems uh, uh, least cost optimization model, uh, we do represent behind the meter uh, storage and within the most recent runs uh, within net zero energy systems, we see a pretty huge um, value to utilizing that behind the meter, uh, behind the meter storage to the point where almost half of the um, total uh, system capacity um, uh, is, is delivered through behind the meter flexibility. Um, the only thing to say there is that we, uh, within these models and, and within uh, the storage flexibility model, we're looking at generally value to the system, so techno-economic value, as opposed to the ability to create revenue in current markets. So, um, and I think uh, there is a uh, there's a comment here from the Active Building Centre, and just to say that they're looking at um, building-based storage and its integration, and uh, and uh, I believe that we're working with the ABC uh, as well, um, and it's definitely worth a look. Um, Next question uh, is, a, is a short one. Which type of storage did they use in the Isle of Giga? Uh, so for the thermal storage, we compared uh, two systems. One was a hot water tank. The other one was a phase change material. Uh, on the top of my head, I'm not sure what phase change material we used, uh, but it, it is detailed in, in the report. Uh, and if somebody wants to come back, back to me, I can. I can let them know. I think it yeah, might I think, be. Um, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think the question was asking what did what did they actually use in the Isle of Giga, where the data came from? Oh, what did they actually use? Uh, so we, the honest answer is I don't know. We didn't do an extensive uh, analysis of 
their study, we were looking for kind of good bad data um, and, and their data was available and looked quite good. So I, I don't know. Great. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, Peter Frampton asking, have we modelled the economics of the backup heat generation? So this is referring to the uh, uh, the, the backup plants for the thermal heat storage, uh, the district heat networks. Um, so have you have you modelled the economics of backup heat generation? Does the market provide sufficient incentives and might there be need for a heat capacity market? Okay, that, that's a big question. Uh, so the, the first bit is, is easy, I can do that. So yes, uh, it was a levelised cost of the, uh, was the cost of the whole system. So it did include, sorry, an annualised cost, but it did include uh, the cost of the backup. Uh, do we need incentives? Uh, I think it's something we need to look at quite carefully. Uh, yes, we probably do, because if not, I suspect gas boilers are going to be the, the, the cheapest, so there's no incentive, people are just going to put in gas boilers. Uh, so you probably do need an incentive to bring people away from gas. Uh, whether you have a specific uh, heat incentive or whether you have a, a more broad carbon tax type based system, uh, that's another question. Certainly our markets policy and regulation team have done a lot of work on carbon pricing. And they've be more than happy to discuss that in a, in a bit more detail. Okay, great. Um, okay, so there's some more questions coming in as we go along. Um, first one would be one's what geographical scale of uh, pumped hydro storage would be required in your scenarios? Uh, geographical scale. Um, um, so we're talking about how I guess, the land area that's required. Um, yeah, I think um, if I can if I can come in on this one uh, within uh, if, if I can talk about the catapult uh, gen general view of pumped hydro storage, we um, have build and uh, maximum build capacities that we uh, use that are based on underlying evidence provided by either ourselves or by other sources, and I um, uh, I, I believe that the um, the scale of pumped hydro storage that we use is supplied by work done by SSE maybe about eight years ago. Um, if you are you're, you're anonymous on here, but if you would like to uh, get in touch with us to ask uh, uh, we to ask that question again, we can um, we can get back to you in more detail about our underlying assumptions. Um, I mean, a lot of the underlying assumptions that we use are already available within our ESME data references book. Uh, so if you just Google uh, energy ESME data references book, then it will come up with a um, publicly available source of where we get a lot of our data assumptions from. Um, so the, the next question, uh, Dan, is from uh, Jeff Harvey, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Do flat rate distributions cost distort comparison? Um, so a storage technology that is inherently on large scale such as pumped hydro, um, effectively benefits from a flat rate distribution charge from the from, from the DSO and national grid. On level playing fields, uh, domestic scale battery storage should be given credit for not loading the distribution network. Yeah, uh, there's, there's certainly a, a, a point there. I, I think uh, there's a whole series of uh, policy recommendations that we need to make. Uh, I guess the question is, first of all, are they trying to do different things? So is it, is it fair to have the same uh, kind of policies or regulations for, for, for both? Uh, but I, I do think it's something that should be looked at. But I also think, I mean, pumped hydro does have its own kind of uh, regulatory barriers. I mean, it's we've not built a pumped hydro system uh, well, since the uh, denationalisation of the energy system uh, and or the privatisation, and uh, there's barriers there around kind of investment upfront and costs. Uh, so I think it's something that's worth looking at, but I, I do think I would be slightly reluctant to start kind of looking at specific storage technologies too much and saying, well, this policy is right for them. I think it's more about saying, 
what's the type of storage we need? So is it short duration distribution storage? OK, then let's do something for that. Is it this type? And do they, do they stack up? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and just to add to Dan's point there, um, we, I mean, we within this work that we've done here, we're mostly looking at the um, uh, the uh, the technology based cost um, value. Um, uh, but I think within our NPR, uh, with our markets policy and regulation research, we're doing a lot of work at the moment around rethinking electricity markets. So, and a lot, and this largely focuses on how we distribute, um, we, we fairly reflect costs that technologies impose on the energy system within the um, where, within the cost that they see to operate. So, um, I mean, uh, so I, I'm not sure if I fully. Uh, agree with the comparison made because pumped high, large scale pumped hydro is likely to provide quite different uh, functionality to behind the meter battery storage on the network. But I think the general point is that yes, we need to make sure that the um, costs that are um, in, imposed onto the network by the use of a different given technology um, need to be recognised in the kind of strategy we have for which technologies we use in the first place. Um, so I generally agree with you, with you, with you Jeff, um, but again, if you would like to get in touch with us afterwards, we're happy to carry on this conversation and loop in some of our NPR team. Um, Dan, there's a, a couple of questions from Alex Hunter from Sherwood Power. Uh, so has the cost of end of life disposal or recycling been factored into technology costs? Uh, no, so, so not at the moment. These are the costs we use are the, the power costs and the uh, energy costs, so it doesn't include uh, end of life or, or disposal. And uh, and the second question from Alex is: Is the product lifetime factored into the storage solution? Uh, for example, i.e., if pumped hydro has say a fifty-year lifetime, is that factored against lithium ion with with a life of say eight years? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, that that's factored in. So we have different lifetimes for for all technologies, uh, and depends on what analysis you're doing. But that's one of the reasons you see is things like the levelized cost of pumped hydro uh, do do quite well, uh, and also it, it's one of the kind of one of the considerations you have to think about when you're using these models. So, for example, pumped hydro may come out looking very very strong because it, it has a long lifetime and therefore quite a low kind of cost, but as we know, they're still not being built at the moment. And part of that is because that doesn't take into account that the, the high upfront investment. So uh, when you're using these models, you do need to think about, well, OK, this is why the model has done something. But what does that mean in real life? Do we need some kind of policy and regulation in or some market incentives to make sure that the, the benefits we see on the whole system side are uh, made to kind of materialise in the commercial uh, world? Yeah, and just to follow up on the first question there, um, so the end of in terms of end of life and recycling, um, it it depends on the model that we're referring to here, and it depends on the technology that we're referring to. Some of the um, decommissioning costs for, for example, large scale power plants, um, and which could be providing flexibility, are um, are, are, are accounted for within the uh, capital costs of the technologies. But if we are referring to say lithium ion batteries. Uh, we currently don't include the recycling costs at the end of the life within those store technologies. And I think it is something that we, we should probably be looking into, uh, looking at um, representing a better, uh, having a better representation of whole life costs for every single technology that we have within our whole energy system models. So thank you for the question. Um, so there's a question um, from uh, Aisha Hani. How can the recovery process of second life batteries be improved? Yeah, uh, quite a big question. I think one of the things here, if it can be done, is standardization. So a big problem you've got is we were very aware when we started that uh, a battery from one car manufacturer is not necessarily the same as a battery from another. Uh, what we found in doing it is that actually two batteries from the same manufacturer and sometimes the same car aren't even the same depending on the model. So you've potentially got this issue where you've got all these batteries that need to be tested and refurbished but they're not they're not the same so there's there's more work to be done there uh whereas i mean there may be other reasons for not doing standardization but from the point of view of uh second life batteries if you had a standard battery or uh 
that would make make life a lot easier and then you would see costs come down so i think th th there are other things in the detail in, in the report but i think that's that for me is the big one excellent thank you i think i think uh, there are still some questions um coming in but i'm really sorry that uh, we're not going to have time to get uh, around to them today we will um, if we've got your email address here, we will follow up uh, with you with some responses. Um, if you'd like to carry on the discussion around this area, which I think there's a lot of engagement here, and we'd love to carry on that discussion with each of you, then please do get in touch to, to, with Dan through the email that's on the screen right now. Um, I'd also just like to mention that we uh, we haven't talked much about the storage flexibility model um, within this uh, within the, within this discussion, but we've got. Um, we would love to be able to talk to you about how we can use uh, this fairly new and very, very comprehensive model around storage of flexibility to help you and your in, in you and your innovations um, uh, understand your value to investors, understand the role that your technology could play within net zero energy systems, and to develop um, uh, understand how different energy systems can impact upon your uh, your deployment strategy. Um, so if this if this is of interest to you, then please do um, let us know. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you for um, uh, thank you for attending this, and it is great to have such engagement. And we really hope that we can uh, keep in touch with a lot of you, uh, a lot of you going forward. Um, and thank you very much to Dan for for the presentation. Um, yeah, thanks, guys, for attending. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.